There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Good evening and welcome to the Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, sitting across from the board from me, Mr. Tim Dennis. Good evening, Tim. Hey there. Hey, we got uh, some exciting stuff happening here. We've got uh, our Waverly Hills trip is up and for sale. It's going to take place at the end of July, July 27th through the 30th. Two nights to investigate Waverly Hills. Um, You don't get one, you get a full two nights to uh, go out there. We've got some great talks and lectures that are going to be taking place. So check out that information by going to darknessevents.com. Also, we have about 20, 25 tickets left for the Queen Mary event. And it looks like this could be our last Queen Mary event uh, because new management regime at the Queen Mary is trying to stray away from some of the paranormal aspects of it. And they're they're trying to price us out of the ballpark from doing events there. So I, I think this may very well be the last Darkness Radio Taps paranormal retreat at Queen Mary. So mm. go check that out at Darkness Events as well. Wow, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff go on in the last week, Timothy. Yeah, yeah. We've lost, uh, you know, Sidney Pollack passed away. Yep. So that's a, that's a shame, of course. And, yep. uh, you know, uh, Indiana Jones... And the, Passed away? Uh, yes. No. Oh. Did you hear? $311 million opening weekend. I think Spielberg got to say, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, we can't do 500 here, people? So, so do you think that's going to spawn some more sequels? Are we going to see no, uh, the adventures of Mutt Jones and the Temple of I want to see, Scooby-Doo or I something? I want to see Indiana Jones run away from a boulder with a walker in yes. hand. Yeah. It was a great movie. I will say that. I really enjoyed it. A lot of people are beating up on it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Just an entertaining movie and, and a, a, you know, harken us back to the 80s when you could have just a good time and, and let go with a movie. So I would definitely mm-hmm. recommend it. But, yeah, $311 million. A lot of cool stuff going on. Um, again, please keep Denise and Michael Jones in your prayers. Michael uh, Jones is a son of Denise Jones. Uh, she uh, he, he had cardiac arrest about a week and a half, two weeks back now, and is still recuperating. Um, they're still having problems with blood clots. So uh, please keep them in your prayers and in your thoughts and send out your healing energy and Reiki. Do everything we can. If we can come together as a community, we can make this boy healthy again. Uh, and with the help of uh, our God and everybody that's uh, out there listening, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see uh, Mike back on his feet and feeling better real soon. Now, Tim. Yes, sir. Been on the air almost three years. Oh, yeah, two and a half. All right. Well, yeah. it's almost three. It's closer to three than it is to one. So mm. I'll fudge the numbers a little. No, no, Shut up. See, Stop it. Don't so beat me up. Yeah, it's two and a half. And the one thing we've avoided, like the plague, uh-huh. is talking about Amityville. <gasps> yeah. You know, because I felt it's been kicked around and talked about and beaten up and roughed up enough. Yeah. Even when we've had the lovely Lorraine Warren on the show, I've refused to talk to her about Amityville, which is pissing off a lot of our listeners because they want to get into her perspective on Amityville. Mm-hmm. I feel she has, you know, 40 years of investigating, 50 years of investigating of other really great, co- you know, cases and courses. So we've tried to keep it keep it that. Well, I've, I'll tell you what. I've had the opportunity in the last year to meet a really great guy. Um, uh, he's got his own radio show out of uh, Florida. It's called Encounters Paranormal Radio Series. It's uh, based out of West Palm Beach, Florida. They broadcast on Clear Channel's WBZT. That's 1230 a.m. And it's also a live stream on the Internet. You can listen to it live at www.encounterslive.com. Uh, they bring you some of the best in paranormal entertainment each week. They have guests that have ranged everywhere from D. Wallace Stone, you know, the mom from E.T. Yep. I think she was in the original Howling movie as well, uh, to heavy hitters like, um, you know, members of the Ghost Hunters and Taps team. Mm-hmm. Uh, they bring out a, a new guest and a new topic, uh, talking about the unexplained every week, and it's hosted by Tim Yancey, who is our guest tonight. And Tim, uh, aside from being a longtime paranormal researcher, 
he has also dealt with malicious hauntings in his life, and he was he ended up becoming friends with uh, George Lutz from the Amityville Horror Case. Mm-hmm. And listening to Tim do a few talks at these events, uh, you know, it re-inspired me to maybe we should reinvestigate a little bit of the Amityville Horror and and bring some of the cases up. And I'm going to beat up Tim a little bit today, and I've done my research and looking stuff up on uh, the hoax angle of it, and I want to hopefully get to the bottom of some of the, the answers, at least from Tim's perspective and knowing George and, and having researched this subject. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause for our guest this evening, Mr. Tim Yancey. Good evening, Tim. Hey, Dave. How you doing? Doing great. How about yourself, sir? Wow, fantastic intro. Thank you. Hey, well, now tell everybody so they can listen. You're on every Sunday night, correct? Right. We come on just before your show, actually, at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, like you said, it's at EncountersLive.com. So, yep, you guys check that out. You can tune in and listen to the show prior to the uh, um, uh, prior to our show. You get three hours that way of content of uh, some of the best the paranormal field has to offer and, and some great interviews. And, Tim, now l- let's get into this a little bit now. Um, with your show and, and your research into the paranormal, you talk about the fact that you dealt with a malicious haunting as well. Can you give us uh, some background? Tell us a little bit about what happened to you to push you into the field. Sure. Uh, this started for me, my interest in the paranormal got started, like a lot of people's does, um, from firsthand experience. Um, as a child, I, I lived in Florida, and it was, uh, it was a pretty different place back then. There wasn't a lot of big cities like you have now back in the 60s. And so I lived way west of town, and we were out, you know, pretty remote um, where we lived. And I had an encounter in the woods near my home with something that um, I could not physically see but i could see the environment reacting to it it was very frightening for me it had an incredible impact on my life of course i ran fast as i could run back to the house and that began i guess what you would call a haunting for Mm -hmm. um some 30 years my family was um involved in this and experienced a lot of this stuff i've had a lot of friends over the years who have as well and it was because of that that i started to um, kind of reach out to the paranormal community back then. There wasn't a lot of people that were doing this like there is now. Right. <laughs> so I, I started to reach out and, and talk to people like John Zaffis, who is just an incredible violent hauntings case investigator. Uh, other people included Mary Pascarella, who, in, who was one of the first people to investigate the Amityville case, and George Lutz, of course, and other people that had been involved in violent hauntings, and I was trying to find out what was going on and how to put a stop to it. Now, when you're saying violent hauntings, too, with, with the stuff, I mean, did you, did you fear for your life? People are always asking, you know, can, can ghosts kill us or hurt us? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I can say that it was very frightening. There were times when... Um, I remember going to the hospital because I broke both of my collarbones, and it wasn't from anything that an entity did, but it was me reacting to it. You know, when something scratches you across the ribs or or is poking at your feet when you're asleep at night, um, (laughs) I bolted up from the bed and took off running and hit the first wall I could find, and (laughs) that put me into the hospital. (laughs) Thank God Um, that wall was there to stop your fall, huh? (laughs) I'm saying... (laughs) Oh God! But it, but it was it was very frightening for me. It probably affected my brother worse than it did me, and it went on for a long time. And it affected my life and changed my life in ways that you know we could talk about all day. So, are you now? Has this residually followed you into adulthood and into your new lives and into you know your part of the world, or does it just stay centered around the home and the areas that you grow up in? Well, it's. It, it's something that I have. I don't like to call it a haunting. I, I really don't. I, I'm not real high on the on the term violent haunting or malicious haunting or anything. I look at it kind of like a parasite more than anything else. What this does is it creates an air of confusion. It kind of blurs the reality that you're looking at. You start to question what's going on in your head and things like that. And it took a long time and a lot of talking with people like George Lutz to understand that, one, the less attention you give it, um, the better off you are, and two, that there are things that you can do. There's tools that you can use to empower your life, you know, to help you deal with this stuff. Um, It feeds off of negative energy, I found, and things like 
inserting love and laughter and humor and faith and those types of things into your life, it really does a number on this stuff. And the effects have really lessened to where, thankfully, I can say in the last year, probably two years, there have been incidents, but, but minor ones. And, you know, I'm at a place where I can move on with my life and, and go about day-to-day things and, and really put that at rest. Do you do paranormal investigations yourself where you'll go out to homes or businesses where people need help? I, I, I don't like to do investigations um, because ghosts just scare me right to death. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, there are investigators out there that do this stuff. I, I have gone on a few. I've been to places of interest that have interested me. Um, George and I, when he was doing conferences towards the end of his life, he did a handful of conferences here and there around the country. And when we were in locations, we would go out. We'd go to places like the Devil's Tramping Grounds. Uh, we went to Appomattox in Virginia, mm-hmm. uh, Thomas Jefferson's summer home, places that we had heard of that were interesting, and uh, we wanted to go out and look at those. But not in a role that you would think of like Jason and Grant or Patrick Burns or somebody, not with equipment and, you know. Did you, ever, like did you ever fear for yourself, though, Tim, that by going out and investigating and keeping, you know, putting yourself – into that field that it could just continue to perpetuate the problems that you were dealing with? Definitely. That's a real fear for me. Um, And also, do you have a fear that, uh, you know, by going in, and and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, if you have something, as you said, like a parasite attached to you that's kind of leeching off you and doing damage, if people are are aware that they do have a haunting of their own, I know you don't like to use that term, but if they're they're having their own issues with with something out of this world... (coughs) which it seems a lot of paranormal investigators do, do you yeah. think that that can also then open up a world of trouble for the people whose homes and businesses you're being called into to investigate? It's definitely a possibility. You know, I think back to a movie called The Mothman Prophecies, and there's a guy in there trying to explain to Richard Gere what this stuff is. And he says in there that if you take an interest in the paranormal, there's probably a really good chance that it may take an interest in you as well. Right. And I do believe... That's a strong possibility. I also think that the more that, you know, it's like holding up a candle in the darkness there. You never know what may be attracted to it. So for me, yeah, it's a very real possibility. Um, I can tell you that I've done a handful of conferences recently in the last year, and it's something I get very nervous about. The first one I did in Arkansas, I I physically got ill (laughs) beforehand. I was really nervous about it. This last one that we did in Mid-South, I rode in the back of the plane because I passed out on the plane. You know, I get get a lot of anxiety about doing this stuff, and sometimes there is retribution from doing those kind of things, sure. So, uh, Tim, you're you're that affected by the paranormal. What keeps you in it and investigating it and trying to get answers if you're worried that this could be causing you problems? Dave, it's, it's, it's because of people that I've met along the way. And it's because of my childhood and my upbringing. You know, I would have loved to have been a a kid that grew up and was interested in cars and girls and living (laughs) a a normal teen life, but I didn't. And I had this thing that that, um, I, one, was obsessed with and trying to get help with. It wasn't a very fun thing. And I've met people along the way, people like a five-year-old girl and in North Carolina who looked at George while we were at a book signing one day for the Amityville Horror. And she looked at him, she says, does the bad people ever go away? And we found out from that that there was something that was going in her room at night and and pulling her clothing out of the drawers of her room. And, And it would sit in a corner and it would sniff her clothing and say vile absurdities and and things you know this is a it's a violation for the people that go through it and my thing in doing this sure i get to talk about amityville but i also get time to go in there and make the statement that hey this is real it happens to people it's very frightening and when it does it is something that has such a profound impact on their life that um you know we can't measure it how many people you see jumping off of these bridges and things that may have been affected by this, but we never heard their story, and they were led to that extreme? And that's why I do what I do, because for me it was frightening, 
um, and it's something that I have experience in and that I can talk to to people about and maybe help them out along the way. Now, do you believe that you've worked with, uh, or not worked with, but dealt with a demonic form or just a, a really crabby spirit? I don't know. Um, demonic is, is not a word that I like to use. I, I'll tell you that it was definitely an evil energy that affected our family. It was something that tried to, t I don't know, the agenda seemed to be to um, scare us to death, to cause fear, to cause confusion. It was kind of a breakdown of us as a family, um, and it seemed to feed off of that, and so it created that for us. Um, as far as demonic, you know, Ed and Lorraine Warren have always said that the thing that was in the house at Amityville was demonic, and a lot of people use that phrase. Well, Lorraine and Ed were very devout Catholics as well. They were raised in the Catholic faith, and they were taught that that's what this stuff is. And so if you have to label it by that, that's fine. You know, if that's their realm of understanding of it, I have no problem with that. But I don't know. Um, when it comes to demonic, I'm, I'm just not real big on that term because it, it, a lot of people are confused by it. Oh, I agree. I think there's a lot of people that misrepresent, or, or I shouldn't even say misrepresent, but mistake things that are, are not even malevolent for being demonic yeah. because it's something that scares them. That's true. Um, you, know, doing, you know, we've talked about this at our events, where just because you feel somebody pull your hair or poke you or, you know, um, give you a little shove or a plate falls off the you know, countertop doesn't necessarily right. mean that it was evil. Maybe that's all it can do with the energy that it has to let you know that it's there. So jumping to conclusions that uh, you've automatically got Satan, you know, mucking with your life is is maybe a little bit of an, uh, you know, overstatement, and, and it should be looked at more realistically to what it is that you're dealing with. Uh, I, I totally understand it. For people that don't, you know, really get what's going on, if you think about the fact like a bully, bullies feed off of the ability of scaring you and keeping you in control. Um, sure. You know, you watch movies about uh, abusive, controlling men, like, uh, you know, The Enemy Within, I think, with Julia Roberts from back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh -huh. or, uh, or Sleeping with the Enemy, I think it was called. Um, here's this man who lived on tormenting her, beating the crap out of her, and getting that that up. So if that's what these spirits love to do, and they kind of feed off of the energy that you give in those heightened states of, of terror or um, anxiousness, Right. And that's that's going to make it open for you. So I can see I've I've had a lot of people come to me that say, yeah, Dave, you know, everybody tells us, well, if you think about it or you deal with it, you're giving it power. Just ignore it. But we've noticed that when we ignore it, it gets angrier and more violent and more malevolent. Have you found that at all in cases that you've dealt with or researched? Sure. Um, well, I haven't I haven't really investigated a lot of cases, but from personal experience, I can tell you that that's the case. Um I know that in Amityville, they tried to cleanse the house themselves. They had a friend come, say, come over and say, oh, well, all you have to do is, you know, bless the house. Open the windows, say the Lord's Prayer, tell whatever's there to leave, and it'll go. And that didn't work for them. Actually, it got worse. Um, in Stephen Lachance's case, who I know has been a guest on your show, he had a lot of turmoil already with the family there. He had just gotten a, a rather messy divorce. He was trying to find a place to live because he was basically homeless when he found the house. So there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of inner stuff going on in, in a negative way that may have attracted this to it. Um, the, the good news about all of this in doing the research that I've done with people like Carmen Reed and Steve and them and John is that I found out that for some reason it's like spraying... Um, insecticide on a bug that if you can inject as much positiveness into your life um, those things that we talked about just even the power of journaling writing I started at a place where I had to get a journal and just write down something positive in it every day and from there I started taking further steps you know starting to um, have better social relationships and um, I started going to church, and that's something that I found that worked for me because <clears throat> I was surrounded by people who were in a positive light and faith, humor, laughter. Oh, my gosh. 
humor, I don't think evil understands the concept of, of humor. It doesn't get it. It's not something that's built into its makeup. See, Tim, and that's those, the problem with my ex-wives. They must have been evil. <laughs> they just didn't get my humor. That's it? That's it. <laughs> All right, I got you. <laughs> but I, I think that those things really do help, help this. I, I can tell you from personal experience that... In talking to Steve, Carmen, all these folks that you see on TV that have been through violent hauntings, and in my case, every one of them will tell you that those are the things that have worked to help alleviate some of this stuff in their case. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here for our first uh, break of this hour. You're listening to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Our guest, Mr. Tim Yancey, he's also the host of Encounters Live. You can listen to that every Sunday night just leading up to our show. You can do that by going to www.encounterslive.com. If you're out in the uh, Florida area on Clear Channel, you can check out WBZT, 1230 AM, and it's the hour leading up to our show. So uh, I believe that's 9 to uh, nine o'clock till 10. Is that right, uh, Eastern Time? Yeah. Right. Okay. Nine, 9 to 10, 10 Eastern Standard. All right, great. Well, check that out. And again, remember to look at the website, EncountersLive.com. We're going to come back with more and talk a little bit uh, more in depth about the Amityville Horror right after this. It will keep you on the edge of your seat. I must have drank me about 15 Dr. Peppers. I got to pay. Just don't get any on the floor. Hurry back. There is more to come from the darkness on the edge of town. <laughs> Okay, each of you youngins take a gun, a beer, and some smoke. Throttle circuit breakers in. We have separation. Inboard and outboard, they're on. We're coming forward with the side stick. Looks good. I've got a blowout. Paper three. Get your pitch to zero. Pitch is out. I can't hold out the two. Direction alpha hold is off. Trip selector is emergency. Flight calm. I can't hold it. She's breaking up. She's breaking up. Dave. You bastard! Dave Schrader, paranormal host. A man barely alive. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic paranormal host. Dave Schrader will be that man better than he was before. What is it that makes you set up? Better. Stronger. Faster. Run, boy, run! Run, boy! Welcome back to the darkness on the edge of town with Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis. Welcome back to the show, and thank you for listening to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio. We're here with you every Sunday night from 10 to midnight Central Time. And uh, if you can't listen live, remember all of our shows are archived on our website. Simply go to darknessradio.com, click on the archives, and you can listen to the past two and a half years' worth of shows by downloading them. You can also sign up on our site so that you can be a part of the RSS feed and uh, never miss an episode. You'll always get it updated for your iPod and, and uh, be able to follow along with the show. Our guest this evening we're talking to is uh, coming to us out of uh, Florida on the uh, Clear Channel, WBZT 1230 AM. He is uh, the host of Encounters, and uh, you can also hear that by going to www.encounterslive.com. You can listen anywhere in the world by going to www.encounterslive.com and uh, spend a little uh, time with Tim Yancey and the crew every night just before you come over to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Tim, let's talk about, uh, let's start getting into the Amityville horror stuff. How did you end up meeting George Lutz, and, and at what age and, and so on were you at that when you uh, hooked up with George? Well, well, first I have to say that you have the best commercials I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Those <laughs> well, that, are great. That's the all intro. Tim. Yeah, Tim Tim does all the hard work for us here. Right now. <laughs> Those are fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Amityville. Uh, this started, I had talked to George uh, via phone several times, but the first time we met was an appearance he made at Penn State University at a place called Univcon, which is a huge conference that they hold up there right. uh, every year. <clears throat> and I met him at Univcon, too. And I was an audio engineer at the time, and I was sent up to record the shows. And uh, a lot of people were there, and George and I were like the only two old guys there. It's a college town, you know, and everybody's <laughs> really young. So we kind of naturally tended to hang out together, and um, that's where we met. 
And I remember it was Halloween night at a Denny's at 2 o'clock in the morning after his, his talk that he gave that we sat down and we started to talk about this stuff. And I had begun to tell him a lot more about the haunting and stuff that had occurred to my family. And he sat and, and talked about Amityville. And from there, our, our friendship grew. And um, eventually, next thing I knew, I was running AmityvilleHorror.com, which was a website that he wanted to create. And together, we built that up until the day he passed away. And now, is that site still up for people to take a look at and review? It is. Um, there's two websites, actually. One is AmityvilleHorrorTruth.com, and the other is AmityvilleHorror.com. And those are, uh, when he passed away in May, um, I haven't changed them since then, and they're up just um, the way that he left them. Right. That was, uh, you know, we had actually <clears throat> just reached out to try to have George on the show. I think it was about a month or so beforehand, and somebody kind of claiming to be one of his handlers said that they would help us arrange it, and then unfortunately we got the news of his, uh, of his passing. Um, now, when you met George, I mean, a lot of people said he was a very nice guy, but, you know, a lot of the, the haters out there and, and people that have spent their lives trying to debate this hoax uh, also say that, you know, he's a really good BSer and con artist. What did you get a feel from when you were talking to him? Did you get the feel that there was some, you know, a little bit of flourish being told in these stories? Well, well, George was definitely a person who uh, had a very sarcastic sense of humor. Uh, he had a very okay. self-deprecating sense of humor as well. Very funny guy. Um, it was one of those tools that we talked about earlier. And, and so, yeah, he had a lot of humor in him. When it came to talking about these hauntings and his case and working with other people, that tone would change um, instantly. Um, it was something that he was very serious about. It was, um, you know, it, that family had spent 30 years basically being called liars by the community at large, and so they had stepped out of uh, the public eye for, for a long time. And it was only very recently in the last few years of his life there that he had once again started to come out and talk about this stuff. And for him, it was... It was um, the same thing. He got to talk about Amityville, but at the same time, he got to inject that um, there were ways to deal with this stuff, and that was very important to him. What can you separate for us, fact from fiction, from what was being shown in the movies and in Jay Anson's book? Because what I've been told, Jay Anson just kind of, you know, he took some of the real points and then flourished them and, and made them a lot more. And is there any truth to that? Is there any truth to the fact that George and Kathy were not happy with the way the book portrayed the actual haunting and, and the story. Sure. Um, George always said, I remember on, on several occasions, him saying that of everything that was out there about Amityville, that the book was probably the most accurate um, telling of the story. With that said, it, it, Jay Anson was also uh, an award-winning novelist. He, his big thing was uh, history especially military history and war chronicles and things like that. And he knew how to write a best-selling novel. Um, George and Kathy, at the time that they met Jay Anson and decided that they were going to go ahead with this book, they really weren't at a place in their lives where they were willing to do endless amounts of interviews about this stuff and, and be interviewed for the book. But what they did do was they gave him a series of cassette tapes they had earlier created uh, what he called self-help tapes, where they would sit around the table and just talk about this stuff, and they wanted to record it and to get it down on tape. And um, it wasn't the most coherent as far as a storyline would go. Um, they would just recall incidences as best as they could recall. Now, um, it turned out to be about 40 hours of tapes. They gave those to Jay Anson and said, here you go, you know, you can do your best with these, and we'll try to help you in making corrections. They would send out galleys, and Kathy wasn't really interested in trying to edit the galley sheets, but George would do the best that he could with it. And from that, Jay wrote the novel. Now, Jay um, didn't get everything right. Of course, there was creative license used in the book, um, a lot of the incidences, you know, Jay was interested in writing a best-selling novel, not necessarily telling the, the most accurate story right. that he could. And from that came the book, and then later the movies, and the movies were 
really bad in terms of accuracy. I mean, the last movie that MGM did um, showed him uh, seven attempts of murder on his family and his wife, those types of things, killing the dog, all types of stuff. So that created a lot of confusion for people in, uh, in the telling of the story. Well, right. I mean, they definitely took some creative license in the the newest version of the movie, but I think that was to kind of change things up because people were familiar with the original movie and they were looking to just scare it. It almost got the sense that they gave up on the idea of it being a real story and just decided to change it into a a, a really well-written horror book that they turned into a new movie. True. But a, a lot of people took the movies and the book as gospel, and the biggest mistake that they made was they printed a true story on the cover rather than based on a true story and so everybody took every word that was in the book as gospel a lot of those things didn't happen of course there wasn't blood dripping down the walls or those types of things Uh, there was no pit of hell in the basement that George fell into (laughs) any of that kind of stuff Um, how did George feel about the remake Um, (laughs) if I if I recall hearing at the time he was really quite irritated with it in the way that it portrayed him as some psycho yeah, well, they had rights to remake the movie, and um, from what I understand, it was based on the concept of the same basic characters in the same basic story. And for him, um, I'm sure that it was more than tough for him to see him planting an axe in his wife's chest, which she had just passed away during the making of the film, during the production of the film. Uh, Kathy had... Um, what's known as valley fever. It's an airborne contaminant uh, lung type of the disease. And she was very frail and very, very uh, sick, and she passed away during the filming. So that was tough for George to go into a movie theater and see some of the scenes portrayed in there. Um, There were lawsuits back and forth between them. And uh, in the end, George lost the lawsuits, and then he passed away and always with with a real chip on his shoulder about how his family was portrayed in that movie. With all this, the one thing I think a lot of people, uh, one of the misnomers, and I don't know if you could shed some light on this, is a lot of people just you know wrote this off as it was just a couple looking to <clears throat> raise a lot of money by writing a really good you know ghost story and, and making up a lot of allegations. First of all, shed a little light on it for people. How just how rich did George and Kathy Lutz get from the Amityville Horror? From what I can remember of him stating, and this is just from memory, I believe they made from the books and movies roughly three hundred, three hundred fifty thousand dollars, something like that. Um, I can tell you that with the amount of lawsuits, there's been some twenty lawsuits regarding Amityville Horror over the years. That more than that has gone back into defending the family name and defending the rights for them to even accurately tell one day of their story. So the people that say that they were going to get rich, here's a family that's a newlywed family with children who are moving into a new home and on the hopes that perhaps a book might be written and that perhaps that book will be a bestseller and maybe they'll do a movie on it. And, you know, I don't buy it. That just doesn't work for me. The math doesn't add up. <laughs> right. Well, that was the whole intent, as people said, that they sunk all this money into a house that they couldn't afford with the intention of flipping this house around and, and uh, making a million dollars off of the rights in the story when, in fact, they gave everything that they had up. Is that correct? Yeah, that's true. I mean, what was not to afford? Kathy and George both owned a house at the time when they had gotten married and they had gone out and looked at probably thirty or forty homes over the summer before they found this one the realtor with Conklin Realty Edith Evans showed them the house at 112 Ocean Avenue Um, and the idea was to sell Kathy's house first which eventually did sell for well over forty thousand dollars she moved in with George in his Deer Park home um, from there, they found the house and made arrangements to start moving in, sold George's house for well over $40,000. The down payment was 80000 to the bank, Columbia Savings and Loan. So they were, and this was the house they got for $80,000. And it was valued at probably one hundred twenty-five, hundred fifty thousand. Back in so 1975, right, yeah. Sure, they were already ahead in this, if you look at it. He had a very successful business, contrary to what you've heard. It was uh, William H. Perry, Inc. It had been his grandfather's. It was established in 1917, I believe. 
and um, it was the only type of surveying business in New York that was doing the type of work that they did at the time. So he was very successful at that. Well, let's let's take people back to. I mean, the story for for George and and Kathy kind of started in the summer of '75, right? When they bought the house and they moved in. Leading up to it, you know, we've heard about the DeFeo murders. Were there right. any claims of of haunting or strange stuff that happened at that time that led to Ronnie, other than just the the claims that they used in court later on? Sure. Um, Ronald DeFeo has made endless statements over the years since this happened about things that went on in the house. Later, he recanted them, saying, well, that was just, you know, trying to cop an insanity plea for the trial. Well, years after the trial was over in 1979, he said in an interview with Hans Holzer that they would hear noises in the house, people screaming, but there wasn't nobody screaming, um, that paintings and objects would move around the house from the first floor up to the third floor, ghosts, all of that kind of stuff. Um, the was there any kind of... Uh, any kind of research done on the house prior to them i mean is there what, what is this is this the old ancient indian burial ground theory that we got in poltergeist or what why would this land be so wrought with well, with haunting well a lot of people have made a lot of various claims they a lot of people investigated the house mm-hmm. lorraine and ed warren uh their prognosis was that it was demonic and that it couldn't be fixed that's why george and kathy left the house Hans Holter came in later on and investigated the house with a psychic medium, Ethel Johnson Myers, and their conclusion, because Hans Holter, you have to remember, is an atheist. He doesn't believe in God mm-hmm. and those types of things. So their, their prognosis or diagnosis of what happened was that it was an Indian burial ground that was there, that there was a, an Indian chief whose grave was defiled, and that it was the Indian chief causing all the ruckus inside the house and other people have made other claims well so, isn't there a way to go back historically and actually find this so it's not just claims it's well sure the amityville historical society that house was built in 1928 there was an original house that was on the property that belonged to patrick j moynihan the moynihans wanted a bigger house for a bigger family so they moved that house a few blocks away and lived in it while the dutch colonial was built around 1924 1928 at that point, they moved into that home, and the Amityville Historical Society, from what George told me, had all kinds of documents that related to um, the history of Indians living on the property and um, all sorts of things like that. When the movie came out, all of that stuff got spirited away, and it disappeared from the archives. Yet, Laura Dedeo, who was a uh, news reporter for the local um, news station up there still has that documentation, and I have copies of it as well. So does Hans Holzer. So there is there is evidence that shows that Indians did live on the property and around the property at the time, but um, it's hard to come by for some reason these days. Well, I wouldn't think that'd be too hard to to research just in you know <clears throat> sure. Indian Indian heritage and lore, knowing what was going on out there. So sure. So this happened. Now, what happened with? Ronnie DeFeo. I mean, what's the story of the murder? And, and, you know, there's been so much speculation and, you know, disinformation given by both Ronnie and his attorneys and and other people looking to make a buck. What do you know or understand to be true about what actually occurred the night Ronnie DeFeo Jr. killed his family? Well, let's look at the evidence that we have available to us. If you look at the original crime scene photographs, you'll see that there were statues that were placed all around the property. They had statues inside the home and outside the home. And they had built these huge concrete paths for them. And there were religious statues, statues of the Holy Family, and they were placed on the property about six months before the murders took place. And it was always George's belief that the DeFeos knew that something was wrong with the house. I mean, you know, we talk about violent hauntings and what attracts these violent hauntings to a family and there was a lot of dysfunction with that family big ronnie defeo senior was a very abusive husband he was abusive to the kids it's all well documented and something happened about six months before the murders took place that caused him to become very religious he went to canada he had these statues made brought them back and placed them on the property and neighbors would suddenly see this big guy um, out saying a rosary to a statue of St. Joseph on his lawn in the morning. 
people who would ask him what happened or what's going on with all the religious stuff, he would answer them with phrases like, I have the devil on my back. And some people say he was referring to his son. Some people say he was referring to something else. So <clears throat> the fact that these religious statues were there kind of showed that something was going on with the family before this. And then on November 13th, 1974, the murders took place. And eight rifle shots with a 36 caliber Marlin rifle, or a 35 caliber, I'm not sure, Marlin rifle, went through the house that night. Ronald moved from room to room. He killed all of his uh, brothers and sisters and his family. No one seemed to hear the gunshots because nobody moved out of bed. They were all in the almost the exact same position with arms extended and a right leg pulled up, almost like a like there was somebody that helped um, and held them in bed when this happened. There were no evidence of drugs in their system, so they shouldn't have slept through this, but they did, apparently. Ronald DeFeo later testified in court that a female, some sort of an apparition with black hands, handed him the rifle that night. And that it wasn't like they were covered with gloves, but it was black like a void, like you hear um, Rosemary Ellen Guiley talk about shadow people that type of thing, and that while he moved from room to room, he heard voices telling him to commit the murders, and that he saw these shadowy figures that were moving from room to room that night. So that came out in court testimony, and George had nothing to do with that, <laughs> you well, know. Um, well, let's, let's take our second break here. When we come back, we'll kind of go from where the story takes off then. You're listening sure. to The Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show with our guest, Mr. Tim Yancey. For more information on Tim, go to his website at www.encounterslive.com. You can also check out the other two websites that he's run, which is uh, amityvillehorror.com. That's AmityvilleHorror.com and AmityvilleTruth.com, I believe, is the other one. So check those websites out. We'll be back with more right after this. Director's Log. I can't believe I'm with these Darkness Radio dorks again. It's like having bamboo shoved underneath my fingernails. Please, somebody shoot me. Don't you dare move. There's more to come from the darkness on the edge of town with Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis. If you bleed from the ears while listening to Leo Sayer Records, would it qualify as a paranormal experience? I thought so. Welcome back to the darkness on the edge of town. Ooh, that hurts. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio. And our guest this evening is Mr. Tim Yancey, host of Encounters. Uh, and Tim, we're talking about the Amityville Horror Case. And the yep. research that you've done, uh, it seems like you know your stuff. You've, you've moved along through this pretty well. And, again, people can check out the websites, AmityvilleHorror.com, and uh, the other side is AmityvilleHorrorTruth.com, correct? Right. Okay. Right. And they can follow along. And you've got a, a great collection of information there that you've put together that show very specifically some of the things to back up all of the cases and the stories that are being said and, and shared out there. Now, let's talk about some of the stranger um, if you will, you know, parts of the of the story. Okay. You know, flying pigs, bleeding walls, <laughs> flies, a priest that slapped around and, and you know, um, you, you know, while trying to do the blessing for the house. What right. can we what can we differentiate? What's true, what's not, and is there somewhere in the middle that, that you found that is a a better representation of all the different stories? Well, we'll go down the list. We'll start with uh, the pig, the flying pig. Um over the time that George and Kathy were in the house, um, Missy began acting a little strangely. Um, they began to notice that she would be in her room singing, for instance, and as she walked out of the door of her room, she would stop singing. And she would go down the hall, do whatever she was going to do, and when she'd come back, she would begin singing again, uh, right where she picked up at. She came down to Kathy one day and she said, Mommy, do angels talk? And Kathy said, Well, yeah, I guess so. Why? and they discovered that she had what they thought was an imaginary friend and its name was Jody and Jody had the ability to peer to her as a uh, pig a very large pig sometimes as big as the whole house or a very small pig um, a little boy uh, he would manifest to different people in different ways and they found out over the years that Jody wasn't so much um, imagination uh, he would make statements to Missy 
that uh, she was going to live there in that house forever. And so they began becoming a little disturbed about <clears throat> this apparition that they called Jody. Um, there was an incident where, in fact, several times while they were there, that they would be sitting on the couch in the living room or at the window upstairs in Missy's room and see eyes peering into the room. Or George was coming back from the boathouse uh, one time, again at night. The door would always open in the middle of the night down at the boathouse. And he'd have to go out there and shut the thing. And on the way back, he saw a form in Missy's room that night. It was a human-shaped form. Ran upstairs, went into her room. She was right there asleep, and, of course, nobody was in the house. So that's where, where Jody came from. So this levitating demonic pig it used to hang outside her window and watch her, or did anybody else ever see the pig? I know James Brolin in, in the first movie you know, would see the glowing red eyes outside the, <laughs> the window right. and the squeals. Was that ever an actual part of their history and story? Yeah, uh, George did see that coming back from the boathouse. That was added into the movie. It was pretty accurate. Um, the babysitter scene, you may recall in the movie there was a babysitter who got trapped in the closet type of thing. It was kind of like that, but not exactly right. Um, he, George had an aunt who came to the house and stayed, and she also saw a little boy in Missy's room. But he wasn't like the ghosty boy photo that you may have heard about or you may have seen in the presentations. It was a little boy, but he was blue. Um, and that's, that story turned into the babysitter type of thing. Um, now let's there, talk about that picture, too. Now, if people Google it or, or look around on enough of the websites, and I don't mm -hmm. know, do, do you guys have it up on your site? or? I'm no, we don't. Um, oh, you know what? If, if you go to, uh, here, here's a website for people that would like to see the picture of the ghost boy. Um, and please bear with me. I'll spell it out for you. It's S K E p d i c dot com slash haunted dot h t m l again that's s k e p d i c dot com slash haunted dot h t m l there is a very clear representation of the photograph there what do you know about that photograph that was shown i mean according to the story here is it said that uh that uh the photograph was taken um with uh, was it ed and lorraine warren uh, yeah. They did an infrared time-lapse photography, and there seems to be a boy with uh, these kind of glowing eyes staring, in the foot case, uh, or, or staring sure. at the foot of a staircase. And that was actually shown on the Merv Griffin show, it says here, as well. Right, right, it was. They had a photographer who developed their photography, as an, uh, their photographs and pictures. His name was Gene Campbell, and he had always wanted to go on an investigation. So when Amityville came around, he went with them. And he set up a camera on a tripod on the landing there, and it was an infrared photo, and it was set up on a timer kind of thing where it would just randomly shoot pictures through the night. And <clears throat> the strange thing about the photograph there was that it doesn't match anybody who was uh, present at the time. It appears to be a young boy um, leaning out of the staircase. He seems to be wearing pajamas of some sort. And um, I've, I've been through all of the photographs that were taken that night and everybody that was there, and I can't find anybody that that photograph matches to. Um, there's an even stranger picture that was taken that night of a cameraman. You'll see um, Marvin Scott holding a microphone with a cameraman and a lighting guy behind him. And everybody's hands are present and, and accounted for, but there's a third hand up on the camera that nobody can explain. So, yeah, there were a few um, strange photographs that were taken that night. Now, wasn't George the photograph of the little boy, don't they claim, though, that there was nobody on site for it, but the little boy does have a resemblance to one of the DeFeo children? Apparently so. Um, if you take the name Jody, which we were talking about the flying pig earlier, and take one of the children who lived there when the DeFeos were there, John DeFeo, the first two letters of, of the name would be Joe D. And so Scotty G., who worked with the History Channel on the Histories and Mysteries segment, matched up the photographs of John DeFeo and this child that's in the Ghosty Boy photograph, and the resemblances are pretty striking, actually. Now, is this, uh, could it also be, I'm just looking at the picture here, now I've heard the, the debate that it isn't like glowing eyes, but it almost looks like the kid is wearing glasses and it's just a reflection off the lens. Yes. 
um, I have a very high resolution picture of the ghosty boy, and it does appear to be glasses that he's wearing and a reflection. That that is true. Um, if you ask me, I'd say he was wearing glasses. All right. And, you know, I know we're going to get, I'm going to be remiss if I don't ask this, I have about a minute, minute and a half here before we go to the top of the hour break. But okay. uh, we talked about the fact, now, in the movies, it looks like their house is just kind of this isolated little house on a, on a beautiful little uh, hill, and it's nowhere near anything. And in reality, the houses are, are very close to each other, aren't they? Uh, they are. They're very close so together. how did neighbors... You know, I, my neighbors in my in the houses that have been on the other sides of me, I can hear when they slam their front door. How can you not hear eight shotgun sounds or rifle sounds go off in a house that nobody ever heard at night? Well, these are the things that confuse the Amityville Police Department as well. They um, there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there, especially the new movie. It has some special features, and in one of them, the police chief and the people, the coroner who investigated the murders. They were stumped by that. They had no idea how nobody heard the gunshots, how nobody in the house even woke up uh, hearing the different shots that were fired. And um, it's, it's just a mystery that still lingers. And even the mother and father were laying side by side. They looked like they hadn't been disturbed. And how did one not react to the sound of the gunshot for the other, correct? That's true. That very, is true. Very bizarre. I, I have never come to understand that. There was some evidence in the trial that showed that one of the girls may have awakened and opened her eyes because they found unburned gunpowder particles in her eyes. But you have to remember that she was shot at point blank in the face and <laughs> unburned gunpowder particles in her eyelids could have been a result of such a high impact uh, at such a close rate. So it, it's one of the mysteries of the fail murders that, that still stands to this day. Well, Tim, stick with us. We're going to be back after the top of the hour. Can you hang with us for a little bit more and talk more? Sure. All right. Sure. We'll be back with more with Tim Yancey. And again, if you'd like more information, you can check out Tim's websites, AmityvilleHorror.com, AmityvilleHorrorTruth.com, or you can check him out directly at his website for Encounters. And uh, check that information out. Get yourself ready. And we'll be back with more, and we'll take more of your questions right after this.